I want to thank Stevie for filling in last Sunday and doing a good job. We listened to it online last Sunday evening. And thank you guys for being so good to him. Encouragement goes a long way, and you've given him tons and tons and tons. When we talked to him last Sunday night, he was just on top of the world. He loves coming here and speaking. We had a great vacation. We did absolutely nothing for a week. Uh, literally, we turned our phones off, and um, mine didn't come back on until a week later. And the most important decision we had to make during the day was when we were going to eat supper. And about three days in, we decided that uh, it was a long day and we were going to take naps in the afternoon. So then came the second decision, when to take a nap and how long. And that was about the extent of it. So we come back very, very well rested and fat and full. So thank you guys. Thanksgiving. We're going to continue on that theme this morning from last week, from Thanksgiving itself. And we're going to talk this morning about how to be thankful even when you may not feel like it. There are times in our lives when things are going on and we're in the middle of a situation that we have no control over and it's not one that we picked for our life. And we don't feel very thankful personally. But I hope that we can open up our eyes and see the bigger scope of things and know that we have a sovereign Lord and Father who knows far better than us. And if something comes into our life, from a sovereign God, and it arrives on our doorstep, and in his power he could have prevented it, then we need to understand that there's a reason for it and that we are going to learn from it. And it's a good reason, maybe not at the moment from our perspective, but from his eternal perspective. So that's a plan for this morning. But as always, before we talk about the sun, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his father first. Father, we come um, trying to be obedient to every scripture that you've given. In Ephesians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 1, um, it lays out a, a plan and, and an order. It even says that it's your will. It seems like a tall test for us at times to be thankful in everything. And in Thessalonians, to be thankful in all things, for this is God's will for you. And so I pray that you'll teach us to open up our minds and our hearts this morning that we might receive teaching about the truth of thanksgiving and what it does and the fact that there are so many things present in our lives as believers right now that we can always be thankful for something. Father, we're thankful for Jesus and him crucified. We're thankful for a blood-stained cross and an empty tomb. And we're thankful for the opportunity to say yes to him and to follow him and to receive an address in eternity. As we open your word this morning, Father, we ask you to come in a powerful way. We pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We've come to this place to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And our prayer is that in the time that remains that we would hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 4 through 9, where the Apostle Paul talks about thanksgiving, and he writes as follows, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was conformed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Now, we're going to take a look at some things that we can be faith or thankful for, even when we don't feel so thankful. But before we do that, there's one sore thumb that sticks out of this text that we need to take a look at on the front end. So sore thumb number one and only this morning, I want to show you something very wise about the Apostle Paul. And it's typical of the writings of Paul. I want you to please note that Paul encourages before he corrects. Let me say it again because it's important. Paul encourages before he corrects. Look at verse four. I always thank God for you. 
Please note in this text the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul. And then after verse 10, he lowers the boom on the church at Corinth. Napoleon once said, give me enough medals and I'll win any war. Where there is encouragement, people can do almost anything. We've all heard about people who stay on and work for a company for 50 years just to get that gold watch with their name imprinted on the back of it. Encouragement means a lot. I lived out the reality of that illustration at Atlanta Saw, where I worked for a few years. They had what we called the Hall of Fame, and it was a hallway that led from the office complex out to the manufacturing plant, and it was a long hallway. And on the walls of that hallway were the pictures of the people who had worked there for 30 years. If you worked there 30 years, at the end of the 30 years, Mr. Anderson, who owned the company, would send you downtown in Atlanta to a photographer, and they would take a great picture of you, brush it up, put it in a very expensive frame, and put it up on the wall. And I knew a lot of people who would retire on the first day of that 31st year, but they would stay there 30 years. Why? Just to get their name and their picture in the Hall of Fame. Encouragement means a lot. I don't like criticism. Nobody likes criticism. If you say you do, you lie about other things. I remember at the first church that I served, I had a man who would criticize me constructively from time to time, and very unlike me, I would take it from him. He would come up to me and he would say, Bill, I love you. You know that. I love the things that you say. I come here and I listen to your sermons on Sunday morning. I find myself quoting what you've said all week long at work to my friends, but, and then he would offer some constructive criticism. You see, he encouraged before he lowered the boom. We need to learn that in our lives. We need to learn that in dealing with people. Before saying anything negative, we need to say at least three things positive. Before saying anything negative in love, as the Apostle Paul says, We need to learn to say three things positive. I've been beat over the head a lot in my life, but if you'll take the time to put a pillow down before you start wailing away, it means all the difference in the world. We can find three nice things to say about anybody. I've learned that we can say positive things about everyone, and it's a principle that the Apostle Paul uses, encourage before you correct. All right, with that appetizer out of the way onto the main course, how to be thankful even when you may not feel like it. Let me give you a great verse. It's Ephesians 5.20. And I want you to take a look at this verse with me. Ephesians 5.20. Look at the first word. Always, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks for everything. What that means is that whatever is happening to you right now, no matter what it is, God says to give thanks for it. It may sound hard, but it's true. And we can do that because Romans 8, 28 is true. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and have been called according to his purpose. That means that everything that's happening has a purpose, and it's a good one, even though we don't see it from our perspective. And so no matter what's happening, praise God and thank God there's no exception to that. No matter what is happening in your life, it went through a nail-scarred hand before it got to you. And we have a sovereign God who is in control of every single thing in this universe. And if he allows and permits something to come our way that he could have in his power prevented, then there's a reason for it. And we need to understand that. Give thanks today and hope grows for tomorrow. I believe that with all my heart. Give thanks today, no matter what you're facing, and hope grows for tomorrow. I believe that there is great power in thanksgiving. I believe that thanksgiving ticks Satan off to no end. When we give thanks in the middle of something negative that's going on in our lives, he just gets ticked. You want your prayer life to explode and quit complaining and start thanking him. You want God to do great things in your life? Then fill your heart with thanksgiving and praise, no matter what's going on. You want God to bless the things that you do? Then in all that you do, praise him and give thanks for what happens. Paul says in verse 4, I always thank God for you. He's talking about the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth should have been the last thing the apostle Paul was thankful for. Problems, oh my goodness. You talk about problems. 
They had been turning away from Paul. They wouldn't accept his authority. They were constantly bickering back and forth in the church. They were hopping in and out of each other's beds. There was sexual immorality everywhere. They did just the opposite of what Paul told them to do. And yet, and yet Paul praises and thanks God for this church. That ought to teach each one of us that we should thank God for everything, even when things are going bad from our perspective. And so that's the subject before the house this morning, how to be thankful even when you don't feel like it. Listen, it's not happiness that makes you grateful. It's gratitude that makes you happy. Let me say it again. It's not happiness that makes us grateful. It's gratitude that makes us happy. Maybe you're going through a difficult time right now. And maybe it was difficult this past Thursday to give thanks to God. Maybe it's financial problems eating you alive. Maybe family problems. Family's falling apart. Your wife has told you she doesn't love you anymore. You found out that your husband's having an affair. Maybe it's a medical problem that's killed the joy in your life. Maybe you're not able to deal with the sin in your life and everything's falling apart. Paul says that even in times like these, we need to praise God and offer up our thanksgiving in all things. The grace of God is astounding and amazing. And it opens the door of heaven for sinners no matter what we've done. But God's grace is also hard to swallow sometimes because there's a certain amount of pride in our human nature that makes us want to give and give and give because that's a good thing. But to come and to accept a gift is quite another thing. Our pride compels us to give. Let me help those who are less fortunate than me. I will give to this ministry or that ministry. I'll serve. But don't humili humiliate me to the level of the most hell-deserving sinner and tell me that all I have to do is accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I don't have to receive anything. I'm a giver. I'm already good because I give. No, you're not. You see, that's that big argument between legalism versus grace. You can't earn or win anything from God. It is totally a gift, and it's his grace. All right. We can always be thankful for six things that Paul gives us in this text. It's an old saying, when you find yourself in the very bottom of the hole and you can't get out, look for the ladder. And in this text, Paul gives us the ladder. First of all, I want you to see that when you don't feel thankful, remember that grace is free. It's radical and free. Look at verse 4. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. When uh, my dad was killed, mom was in the hospital, the income stopped. Dad had just retired a couple of weeks before they went on vacation and the accident happened. And mom was in the hospital and she could no longer work and dad was gone. He could no longer work. And so I went down to the shop and I knew that there was an account book down there and I was going to send out statements and I remembered from working there as a little boy that there was a place in the back of the account book for bad debts. People that had owed my dad money for years and years and years and had never paid it. And I thought, I've got no stake in this. I'll write a letter to each and every one of them and say, hey, my dad was good to you at one time. Now he's gone and my mom needs some income. Why not pay your bill now? And I remember going to the back where all those bad debts were stacked up. I remember one even, a guy came and paid a $50 deposit down on a washer, washing machine and never paid another dime on it. My dad didn't go repossess the washing machine. And so I got those out and I took a, a paper and pencil and I was going to write down the names and addresses and make letters and send out to see if we couldn't get some income coming in from all of those bad debts. And I saw in red where my dad had taken a pen and wrote, written across to every one of them over 150 Forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. And when he retired, he forgave and canceled their debt. And that's exactly what God has done for you through the cross of Calvary. Jesus went on to, your, went on to a cross in your place, and in his own blood, he wrote, forgiven across everything that we have ever done. You know, when I'm down or depressed, it's kind of like a domino effect or a downward spiral. I begin to lose the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I'm not loving. I'm not joyful. I'm not peaceful. But you know, let me tell you something that I've learned, that God's love for me is not dependent on whether I'm kind or loving or peaceful. God's love for me is not dependent on whether I miss my prayer time or devotion or if I'm a good person. His grace is sufficient, and it's absolutely free, and nobody can take it away from me. 
We all know the definition of grace. It's when God says you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Down in Florida, we had a youth sponsor in our church. He's a great guy. His name was Jim. One night, he had the youth group over at his house, and he had them spread out on the front lawn. And it came time for the lesson. They'd played games and had recreation. It came time for the lesson. He sat down with them. He began to teach the lesson, and there was a new kid there. Somebody had brought, and his name was Kevin. And Kevin was unchurched. He didn't know how to act. And so he cut up during the lesson, and my friend Jim had to call him down three different times. And he continued to cut up, and Jim said to him, Hey, Kevin, you do that one more time, interrupt my lesson. I'm going to take you over there and let you stand under that tree, which was about 50 feet away. And you'll have to stay there until the lesson is over with. And when the lesson's over with and everybody goes inside to eat ice cream, you're not going to be able to go. Well, it wasn't two minutes later till he acted up again. And so Jim kept his promise. He took him over, put him under the tree and left him there and went back and finished the lesson. When the lesson was over, he prayed and everybody ran into the house for ice cream. And my friend Jim walked over to Kevin standing under the tree. And he said, Kevin, you don't deserve to go in there and eat ice cream, but I do. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay out here in your place underneath the tree. And I'm going to let you go in and eat my ice cream that you don't deserve. That's exactly what Jesus did on a cross for all of us. We're always trying to pay for a bill, aren't we? Pay for a bill that's already been paid by Jesus. So when you run out of things to thank God for, remember you are his through grace. And that grace is absolutely free. The great magician, Houdini, used to go around all over the United States and he would challenge sheriffs and corrections officers and jailers to lock him in their jail. And then he would pick the lock and get out. Except one time in Kansas, he came up on a lock that he couldn't pick. The sheriff put him in jail and he stayed in there for an hour. An hour turned to two and then to three. And after three hours, he called the sheriff and he said, I can't unlock the lock. And the sheriff smiled. He reached down, grabbed the handle of the door cell, pulled it open. It had never been locked in the first place. I don't care what kind of prison you're locked up in this morning, whether it's a prison of sin or guilt or temptation, a relationship gone sour, a divorce, lust, anger, a broken heart. God's grace is the key that has already unlocked your cell. All you got to do is push the door open and walk out. There is now, therefore, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. All right. Secondly, I want you to see that when you don't feel thankful, remember not only is grace free, but truth is known. Look at verse 5. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. The Greek word here for speaking is the same word that's used for the word word in the Gospel of John, where it says, in the beginning was the word it's a complicated Greek word to understand, but Charles Hodge, in a very good little commentary, refers to the word logos in all of its translations as truth, as truth. And so Paul is saying, I thank God for in him you have been enriched in every way in your truth and in your knowledge. That says that you have been given a precious gift. You've been given the gift of truth. And not only have you been given the gift of truth, you've been given the knowledge through the Holy Spirit, to perceive that truth. There's an old saying that I love, lies must wear clothes, but the truth loves to go naked. Lies must wear clothes, but the truth loves to go naked. And you hear about the small country church? They were holding a meeting on whether or not to buy a chandelier. Everybody stayed after church, congregational meeting. They were going to take a vote on whether or not to buy a chandelier. And an old timer gets up right before they vote, and he said, listen to me. I'm going to give you three reasons why we shouldn't buy a chandelier. He said, first of all, nobody knows how to spell it. Secondly, if we had one, nobody here would know how to play it. And thirdly, what we need around here is more light, not a chandelier. <laughs> you know, that's the way the world is sometimes. So messed up and confused, they don't understand the truth anymore. Facebook, the source for truth, Right? Liz said to me when we were on vacation, did you know that Faith Hill and Tim McGraw were getting a divorce? I said, you're out of your mind. 
So I read it on Facebook. I said, I don't care. A couple months earlier, she told me that Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman were getting a divorce. I don't know what Facebook has against country music, but neither one of those things were true. And look at all the things that we saw come out during the elections. All the things that so-and-so said and so-and-so said, and we found out that it didn't say them at all. When you're down and things look dim, you remember God has given you the rule book of truth. Not only that, he's given you the instructions on how to play the game. All right, thirdly, I want you to see, when you aren't feeling thankful, remember grace is free, truth is known, and thirdly, that salvation is yours. Verse 6 and verse 8. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, and he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. When I'm down, there are two things that I'm sure of in my life. First of all, I've got it. Second of all, nobody can take it away from me. First of all, I've got it. And secondly, nobody can take it away from me. First of all, that Jesus is my salvation through a life of uh, disobedience and dirt and guilt and sin. And secondly, he always will be. And no one can take that away from me. John 10, 28. No one can snatch me out of the shepherd's hand. You know what that means? That means that because of a strange Galilean carpenter who entered time and space 2,000 years ago and hung spread eagle on cross beams on the town garbage heap between two thieves and died, I'm going home someday. And I'm going to stand before the Father, and God's going to say to me, Bill, what about your sins? And at that moment, Jesus will step in beside me and say, Father, I have those, and I will stand clothed in the righteousness of the Son of God, white as snow. When you're in Florida, people in the congregation had sent us some poinsettias, and and one was uh, one like we'd never seen before. It was white uh, leaves on the plant instead of red leaves. And then we had one that was red. We had a poinsettia bush out behind our house uh, by the corner of the screened-in porch, and it would bloom every December, but it was always red. And we saw this hybrid, this white leaves poinsettia and we'd never seen it before I took him in and I sat him down on the floor next to the Christmas tree and that year the boys wanted the tree lights to be all red they didn't want different colors or white lights they wanted all red lights and so we put all red lights on the tree I remember we went off to church we came home one night and I went in the only thing on in the church was or in the house was the tree lights and they were all red and I walked over to the tree I looked at the two poinsettias on each side and they were both red The leaves were both red. And I thought to myself, has somebody broken in and replaced the white one with another red one? And I walked over to the wall and I flipped the switch. And as soon as the light came on, the white one turned white again and the red one was red. Turned the light off and they were both red. They were taking in the light from the red Christmas tree when everything else was gone. And it's the same way with our sin. Though our sins be as scarlet with Jesus, they are white as snow. When the light of Jesus Christ shines on our sin... Our sins are gone. I don't know how many of you saw the play or the movie Annie. Love and I have seen it a number of times. Little orphan Annie. Daddy Warbucks brings her home to his mansion. He adopts her. He gives her his name and makes her his own. I suppose a lot of people watched the movie and thought what a great little story that was. But you know, the last few times I've seen it, I've watched it and enjoyed it because I remembered that I was an orphan too and that I have been adopted. And my father said, you take my name and because of a cross, you can have my name forever and it'll get you into heaven. You be thankful that salvation is yours for the believing. And if you accept the bridge of Jesus Christ, you can cross over from this world to the next. Salvation is yours. And then fourthly, I want you to see that provision is given. Look at verse 7. Therefore, do not, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 talk about spiritual gifts. But let me give you the Reader's Digest distilled version of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And it is this. If you're a Christian, you have a place. If you're a Christian, God has something for you to do, and he has gifted you so that you might do it. If you're a Christian, you've been given a gift, and I don't know what it is, but there are no degrees of gifts. Mine's no better than yours, and yours is no better than mine. 
You have a place, you have a talent to use in the body of Christ, and you need to use it or you will lose it. You need to use it or you'll lose it, just like the parable of the talents. There was a man by the name of Luigi Turricio. He was an Italian. He collected violins. He put them in his attic. He had 642 violins, the most expensive, unique, and exquisite violins that had ever been made. In his collection, he even had a violin, a great Stradivarius, priceless. They didn't find his violins until 147 years after he died. All of his life, he hid them away, and then for 147 years after his death, they stayed hidden away in an attic, and no one could play the beautiful music that could come from those instruments because he'd hid them. It's like that in the church, too. There's a library of gifts here, but if we don't use our gifts, the church is not going to operate in the way that it's intended to operate. You have a place, and you have a gift God provides, doesn't he? That's something to be thankful for, our gifts and our daily bread. I heard Jill Briscoe say one time, God will always give us our daily bread. It's only when we expect the butter and the jam that we get disappointed. But folks, I'm here to tell you, I've had a lot of butter and a lot of jam that God has given on top of my daily bread. You know, we're getting ready to build a church here. Architects are drawing plans as we speak. And pretty soon we'll have some plans to look at and Find out the time frame, the permitting, and we're going to get started here pretty soon. And everybody's going to come together as the body of Christ with that special talent or gift, and we're going to make this thing happen. Through God, he's going to pull this off. Did you hear about the couple that were out driving on a country road one afternoon, and they got off the berm of the road, and the car went down into a ditch, and they couldn't get out. And so they walked up to a farmhouse about 100 yards up the road, knocked on the door. Farmer came and they said, sir, we got stuck in the ditch out front, just down the road. We were wondering if you might have a tractor, if you could pull us out. And the farmer said, I don't have a tractor, but I've got old Jake and Jake can pull you out. And they said, who's old Jake? I said, Jake's my mule. And so they walked out to the barn and the farmer strapped a harness on old Jake And he walked him out through the barnyard, out through the gate, and down the road to where the car was. And he hooked that harness up to the bumper of the car. He said, you get in and you steer it out. And then that farmer snapped the reins and he yelled, pull, Rusty. Pull, Bessie. Pull, Smokey. Pull, Jake. And Jake pulled that car right up out of the ditch. He thanked the farmer and he said, but i got to ask you one question. He said, why did you call out all those other names before you called Jake? He said, oh, Jake is blind, and as long as he believes he's part of a team, that old mule can do anything, and so can Seymour Christian Church. Fifthly, I want you to see that Jesus is coming, verse 7b, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. When I used to get angry or irritated, which was frequent, I used to count to ten, And then I grew spiritually after becoming a Christian, and I thought, you know, I ought to do something else besides count to ten. And so I would say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I thought about what happened to Jesus on a cross on Friday, and three days later, how things turned out drastically different when he walked out of a tomb on Sunday morning. So I would say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So if you're around me and you hear me say, Jesus is coming, I'm not being spiritual. I'm probably ticked off at somebody. What Paul is really saying is the bottom line of all this mess is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ is in control of everything. And when it's all over with, he's going to come back and he's going to slam the history books closed and he's going to put it all together because he loves us. I've been supporting my wife's ministry for over 38 years. Love sometimes goes away for periods of time. She takes the ladies and goes on mission trips. In the spring, she'll have sometimes six or seven weekends in a row where she has speaking scheduled at banquets and conferences and retreats and things. And then again in the fall, it picks up and there'll be five or six weekends where she's gone. 
And when she's gone doing this, I pray for her, and I pray for me because everything falls in my lap when she's gone. I don't know where things go. I got to do the dishes and get them back in the right place. I got to do the laundry, try and make it work and make the bed. But you know, I've learned that I can deal with the lumps and the bedspread as long as I know she's coming back. I can deal with the lumps and the bedspread as long as I know she's coming back. And it's exactly the same way with being a Christian. You got some lumps right now in your life. You're not sure where things go either in your life right now? We all have struggles. Some of you right now are hanging on by the fingernails. But we can deal with it. We can hang on because we know that he's coming back. I don't agree with many bumper stickers. But I believe the one that says Jesus is coming back and boy is he ticked. He's coming back. And he's going to clean up the mess. And when he does, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. And then sixthly and finally, and very quickly, I want you to see that when you're not feeling thankful, you need to remember that grace is free, truth is known, salvation is yours, provision is given, Jesus is coming, and last of all, God is faithful. Verse 9, God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. And then I told you I was going to start with Ephesians 5.20, a verse, and then end with a verse in 1 Thessalonians that was almost exactly the same. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 through 18. And I want you to read it with me, what it says. Be joyful when? Always. Pray when? Continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For that is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What's God's will for us in Christ Jesus? Be joyful always, pray without stopping, give thanks in all circumstances. You take it from someone whose life is not always faithful. God is faithful. Not once has he ever failed to be there, nor will he ever in the future. You all remember when Stephanie Decker was here two or three years ago and spoke? She was the mom that lost both her legs in the tornado down in Henryville. She protected her two little ones, and she lost both legs, and they went out without a scratch. She was here, and she had artificial legs, and she spoke for us that day, and I talked to her at great length between services, and she was just a delight to get to know. And she said, you know, during all of that, I had so many people try and bring me down to the negative, and they would say, tell us about what happened. Tell us about your story. Wasn't that just horrible that you lost your legs? And she would smile and say, no, I'm good. I'm good because I learned so much about God's faithfulness once I lost my legs. You know, whenever we get ready to throw a pity party, it's a good thing to look around because you can always find someone who's in worse shape than you are. You ever found that to be true? I thought a lot about my mom this week. We went down to my sister's Thursday for Thanksgiving dinner with family and they asked me to pray, and I even thank God for mom because she was the one that taught us those Thanksgiving meals and how important they were. She'd get up early and work hard, and everybody would come together. No matter where we were, we'd come back home, and we'd have that family time together. And mom, she fostered that. She taught us that, and we're still doing it today and now teaching it to a new generation that will have to take over someday. But I thought about mom a lot, and I thought back to a Thanksgiving when she, after the accident, was in the hospital. And by air ambulance, we got her flown home from uh, St. Pete to Seymour, to the medical center here. And they had to bring in this special bed because she had so many bones broken. It was an air bed, and she couldn't get off that bed. And she'd been on it for three straight months, and she had so many broken bones and injuries, crushed pelvis and just all kinds of stuff. But I remember that Thanksgiving at the end of November, after three months, she was still on the bed and couldn't get off. And so that Thanksgiving, they rolled her bed into the waiting room. They always try and cut the population down in the hospital over the holidays, and there wasn't hardly anybody else there. But they put mom's bed in the waiting room, and all of us came in, and we brought in turkey and dressing and all the fixings, and we had Thanksgiving meal there. And I'll never forget, as long as I live, my mom, after the meal was over, I was just sitting beside the bed talking to her, and she was holding my hand. And she looked at me, and she said, Bill, God is so good. Don't ever forget that. God is so good. 
She'd lost her husband of 43 years. She hadn't been off of a bed in over three months. I knew she was in tremendous pain, but she looked at me and smiled and said, God is so good. Son, don't you ever forget that. God is so good. She was able to praise him even at that downtime, and we can too. I think I may have told you before about the little boy that we saw. When we lived in Chicago, we went, we're five minutes away from Woodfield Mall. It was the largest mall in the world at that time, and we went Christmas shopping there. As we were walking through at Christmas time, we saw this little boy, and he had one leg, and he was on crutches, and he was crutching like crazy, keeping up with mom and dad like you wouldn't believe. And we looked down at his crutches, and Billy and Andy were like four and six. We looked down at his crutches, and Andy jerked my jacket and said, Dad, look. And on his wooden crutches, he had woven evergreen boughs. And then he had put little Christmas lights that lit with a battery on each, and they were blinking on and off. Let me tell you something, evergreen boughs and lights on the crutches of a little one-legged boy, that's faithfulness. And God is even more faithful. Let me finish with this. Father, we thank you, and that's what this season's all about. We thank you. You never promised us a a rose garden. You just promised us that every step we take, once we belong to you, you'll take with us. Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And the last part says, I want to share in the partnership of his suffering. And sometimes we like to quote the first two parts of that. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. We can't quote the verse without quoting the last part. I want to share in the partnership of his suffering. And we don't know why that happens, but we saw that it happened to Paul, who wrote the letter that we studied from today. It happened to Peter 
crucified upside down on a cross. In fact, all of the disciples except John died as martyrs for their faith in you. And then we look at Jesus and we saw what horrible things happened to him, but it was for our purpose that it happened. And if we can identify a little bit in our suffering with what he went through, then it just draws us closer to him. So don't let us rail away from the suffering. Let us embrace it and know that it came from a sovereign hand and went through a nail scarred hand before it got to us and that it's going to be okay because we have so many things in place now as believers to be thankful for. And not only that, this is just a third rate hotel, very temporary on our way to be home with you forever. I thank you for the thankfulness of this church. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. Thank you for two weeks ago bringing in $37,000 in offerings in one day and making our people committed to keeping that so that we're a blessed church financially. We thank you for that. We thank you for the new people that you're bringing in the back doors every Sunday and the way that we've grown. We are grateful. We are thankful for all that you've done. Let us be worthy by using our talents and our gifts to serve in every way that we can. Knowing that if we don't, we'll get home someday and we won't have any war stories to tell. And we'll just have to listen for eternity instead of sharing a story. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.